Hi everyone! So in this video I'll be talking about chapter 6 in its entirety and then the first part of chapter 7. So that will encompass the beginning all the way until the end of coping interventions. So chapter 6 talks about stress. So what stress is and how stress is actually experienced in our body what makes events stressful, how we study it, and the idea of different types of stressors. So down from daily hassles, those little things that bug you during the day, up to chronic long-term stress. So to get started, we've all been stressed, I'm sure, especially as students, it's pretty easy to think about times that you felt a bit stressed, but what actually is it? So by definition, we consider stress a negative emotional experience accompanied by predictable biochemical, physiological, cognitive, and behavior changes. So stress is a negative event that our whole entire body reacts to in predictable ways. So the purpose of all these bodily changes is to either alter the stressful event, make it less stressful, or to accommodate to the effects of the stress. So stress is the result of stressors, which are the events that prompt the stress. So a car accident, for example, may be stressful. And in this instance, the car accident would be the stressor and the negative emotional state would be the stress. So the evaluation of an event as whether or not it's a stressor is subjective and personal to each individual. So what one person views as stressful may not be stressful to another person. So stress is the consequence of one's personal appraisal of an event. You're stressing me out right now. Hi. In the appraisal of a potential stressor, there's both primary and secondary appraisals made. So starting with the primary appraisal, this is answering the question of, is this a stressor? Will this result in stress? So something happened, is this actually stressful to me? So to put it more specifically, primary appraisal is understanding what an event is and what it means for you. So with the car accident example, it's appraising whether or not this accident was a stressor and what that means for you. So with primary appraisal, things can be appraised for their harm, their threat, or their challenge. So harm is the assessment of damage that's already done. So for example, the car's wrecked, maybe you have whiplash um, threat is the assessment of possible future damage. So things like, like from the car accident again, things like fines, lawsuits, increased vehicle insurance, etc. Lastly, challenge is the potential to overcome and or profit from an event. So for example, maybe this car was already on its last leg, so you can now replace it because of the damage from the accident. So on average, challenge assessments lead to more confident expectations that you can cope and, un and overcome the stressful event. So if you look at it as a challenge to overcome, you're more likely to be able to cope and overcome it. So after you've assessed whether something is stressful or challenging, harmful, threatening, Secondary appraisal is now the assessment of whether you have the resources to meet the demands of the environment. So you've determined whether something was stressful. Now secondary appraisal is determining whether you have the things that you need to deal with the stressor. So resources can include actual physical resources like money or psychological social resources like energy, social support, things like that. If a person believes that their resources are sufficient, so I have what I need, uh, but a significant amount of effort will be needed, they may feel a moderate amount of stress. So I know I have what I need, but it's gonna be difficult. 
you'll be a little like moderately stressed. In comparison, if a person believes that they don't have the resources to meet the demands, they'll likely experience a significant amount of stress. And then obviously, if a person believes that they have, you know, ample resources, they're less likely to be stressed at all. So therefore, stress can be thought as of a kind of a transaction between the person and the environment and their fit together. So this is the result of appraising events, assessing your potential resources, and then responding to those events. So one of the primary contributions to stress research of note is Selye's work on the general adaptation syndrome. So he argued that when a person confirms that an event is a stressor, their system mobilizes itself for action. And this process is nonspecific, meaning that it will be the same regardless of the stressor. So whether it's an exam, COVID-19, isolation, car accident, it's going to be the same process. So this is the general adaptation syndrome and it consists of three phases. The first phase is alarm, where a person becomes mobile, notices that there's a threat there, recognizes it and becomes mobilized to meet the threat. In resistance, the person makes efforts to cope with the threat. So this is where they're you know, battling against the threat. And lastly, in exhaustion, the person has failed to overcome the threat and physiological resources are depleted from attempting to cope. So in exhaustion, the battle, for lack of a better word, in resistance wasn't won and the threat is still there, but now there's no gas in the tank. There's nothing left to fight it with. So as with any theory, there are several criticisms of the general adaptation syndrome. So first, as you can see, there's talk about um, physiological resources, but there's little consideration for psychological factors, like how you appraised an event. And we know how someone appraises an event as being either stressful or not stressful, and whether you appraise yourself as having the resources. Our appraisal and interpretation of a potential stressor is very important for how we interpret something as being stressful or not. So psychological factors are important and they're not included in this syndrome. Second, this syndrome is considered to be universal. So it's the same pattern for all stressors. But we know that people respond to stress differently due to differentiating factors like their personality and their emotions. So it's not universal for every person and for one person over different stressors. Next, there's research suggesting that contrary to the syndrome, it's not the exhaustion phase that may be the most damaging uh, with accumulating physiological damage, but possibly the resistance phase because that's really where you know the battle's taking place. So in exhaustion, you can kind of think of it as the threat wasn't overcome, but you're not fighting anymore. So there is a break from the resistance. But in resistance, that's where, you know, the battle and all the um, effort is ongoing. So th there's evidence suggesting that that may be the area that um, physiological, psychological damage can come about. And lastly, in this syndrome, stress is assessed as an outcome. So when all this happens, you're stressed. However, and then, and then it's over. But however, people experience debilitating effects of stress long after the event has ended. So this syndrome may oversimplify stress and the impact of stress. Yet this is probably one of the primary cornerstone models of stress. So when we look at the physiological reactions to stress, we revisit the nervous system that we talked about in chapter two. So with stress, two major interrelated systems are involved in the stress response. First, we have the sympathetic adrenomedullary or SAM system. And second, we have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical or HPA axis. So some mouthfuls there. 
Looking at the SAM system, we revisit the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous systems from chapter two. When events are perceived as threatening, they are identified as threats by the cerebral cortex, which transmits that information to the hypothalamus, which then indicates SNS arousal. So remember that's your fight or flight system. Arousal of the SNS stimulates the medulla of the adrenal glands, which then secretes the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this results in that keyed up intense feeling we experience when we're stressed out and the symptoms that go with it. So things like heightened blood pressure, increased heart rate, sweating, etc. So we're mobilized to deal with the stressor. So compared to that fight or flight response of the SNS, remember that the PNS, the parasympathetic nervous system, is supposed to be rest and digest. So in theory, it should not be impacted until the stressor is gone. However, the functioning of the PNS may become dysregulated because of stress. So if you recall that the PNS is implicated in regulating the heart rate, so if it increases with sympathetic activation, it'll go back to normal and decrease with parasympathetic activation. But stress can impact heart rate variability, thus impacting the functioning of the PNS. Changes in heart rate variability can result in dysregulated sleep, and this can impact restoration, because as we know, sleep is where our body restores itself. So this can possibly explain the relation of stress to illness and mortality, because the body isn't getting that restorative time during sleep. So next is the HPA axis, which is also activated in response to stress. When the HPA axis is activated, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH, which then stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH. In turn, ACTH stimulates the adrenal cortex to release glucose, glucocorticoids, which include cortisol, which is particularly significant for stress because it conserves the stores of carbohydrates, which we use for energy, and helps reduce inflammation in case of injury. So it conserves body fuel, so you have the energy to deal with the stressor, and it reduces the inflammatory injury response so we aren't held down by an injury. So if you imagine in primitive times, you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger and you twist your ankle, that's probably gonna become inflamed eventually, but you don't wanna be dealing with that right now. So it suppresses that response so you can still get away. So basically it's a chain reaction pretty much from the brain down to the body. However, Repeated activation of the HPA can compromise its functioning, altering daily cortisol patterns and possibly becoming hypersensitive to minor stressors. So normally, cortisol is high upon awakening because you know you need energy to get up. And it decreases during the day and then flattens in the afternoon and evening. Chronic stress can result in a bunch of different patterns of cortisol. So things like elevated cortisol levels long into the afternoon and evening. So if it stores carbohydrates for fuel, then you can imagine you may not um, feel ready for rest in the evening, get tired in the evening. Um, flattening of the daily rhythm of cortisol. Exaggerated cortisol response to a challenge, so releasing more cortisol protracted cortisol response or even no response at all. So prolonged stress can alter the HPA axis and cortisol levels, consequently altering our ability to respond or recover from any stressors. So for example, people with um, anxiety disorders have been shown to have um, a hyperactive HPA axis. So it's firing at very minute things 
resulting in a stress response that um, may not be necessary. So um, it's, there's a lot of talk in this chapter and in previous chapters that stress can relate to illness. And there's four main pathways that you can distinguish in how stress impacts our health. So first are the direct physiological effects. So direct physiological effects that stress can cause. So this is where stress can alter our biological functioning. So this can include things like elevated lipids, elevated blood pressure, uh, decreased ability of the immune system to fight off infection. So if you think about how we always get colds during exam season and increased hormonal activity. Now, a second pathway involves health behavior changes that arise as a result of stress. So on average, people who live with chronic stress have poor health habits than people who do not. So using the exam example again, um, if you think about when you're really studying for exam season, it seems like you can choose one. You can either shower, you can eat, or you can sleep, but you can't have all three. So if all of those are health behaviors, because you're stressed, you may not engage in all of those, thus compromising your health. Further, acute stress, so even short-term stress, can compromise health habits. These poor health habits include many of those discussed in Chapter 5. So things like increased smoking and alcohol use, poor nutrition, decreased sleep, maybe even increased sleep, um, increased drug use, poor diet, little exercise. Third pathway is how stress can impact psychosocial resources. So although supportive social contacts are protective of health, and there's been a lot of discussion in previous chapters about how important our social circles are for our health, Stress can make a person avoid these social contacts or even behave in ways that drive people away. So if you've ever been kind of snippy and irritable because you're stressed and you might piss someone off. So stress can sometimes threaten social support and reduce optimism and then impact psychological things like reducing your optimism, your self-esteem and your sense of mastery all which contribute to good health, but are threatened by stress. Lastly, the use of healthcare systems and treatment adherence can be impacted by stress. So people are less likely to adhere to a treatment regime when they're under stress and are more likely to delay seeking health services or may not seek them at all. So we may feel we don't have the time, like I just can't deal with this right now, um, or, you know, I don't have the time for all these treatment recommendations, I can't get to the doctor right now, there could be a lineup, blah, blah, blah. However, the sooner we seek treatment for any issues we may be, ha may be having, the more productive we can be, and um, more productively we can combat any stressors. So a lot of times we may not perceive us as having the time or the availability to deal with something, but pushing other things aside and dealing with our health first can actually make us better at work or all the other commitments that we think we need to focus on. So a lot of stressors are short term, but what happens if we're stressed for a long period of time? Long-term stressors can lead to an excessive discharge of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which can suppress our immune system, making us more likely to fall ill. And it can produce adverse changes like high blood pressure, um, increased heart rate. Further, neurochemical imbalances can contribute to the development of psychiatric disorders. And dysregulated catecholamine levels can impact lipid levels and increase the risk of atherosclerosis. Prolonged cortisol secretion can lead to problems with memory, concentration, and verbal abilities. 
because there is evidence to suggest that prolonged and or excessive cortisol secretion can lead to destruction of the neurons in the hippocampus. So it can actually result in some brain damage. Further, pronounced HPA axis activation and frequent cortisol secretion has been linked to depression. Excessive storage of fat cells in visceral areas like um, i.e. belly fat and impacts immune functioning and your ability to sleep. So long-term stress is a contributory factor for various negative health consequences, making you know stress management and prevention of stressors and poor stress management important in health psychology and healthcare. So when we consider our responses to stress, and the consequences of stress. Two main indicators are reactivity and allostatic load. So reactivity refers to the degree of change that occurs in autonomic, neuroendocrine, and immune system responses as a result of stress. So basically how much your body changes in these areas is because of, because of stress is how reactive your body is to stress. Some people are more reactive than others. This is impacted by things like genetics. Some people are just genetically more reactive. Um, prenatal experiences, um, even early life experiences. So genetics that you were born with and when you were still cooking in the womb and early life experiences. So these individuals are therefore more vulnerable to adverse health consequences than our individuals who are less reactive to stress. So in comparison, allostatic load is the physiological costs of chronic exposure to the physiological changes from repeated or chronic stress. So if you imagine being keyed up and on edge for a long time, like being perma-stressed for days or weeks on end, the physiological ramifications of that is your allostatic load. So the consequence of your body enduring stress for prolonged periods of time. Allostatic load can accumulate all the way from childhood, particularly if a person endured a stressful childhood and can affect multiple disease risks across the lifespan. So indicators of allostatic load can include increasing weight, high blood pressure, lowered heart rate variability, among other things. Now, many of these changes occur naturally with age. So allostatic load can be conceptualized almost as a accelerated aging process because of stress. So the expression stress makes you go gray it, there is a little bit of truth to that. Stress can possibly make you age faster. You're not helping. I really don't know why she's so gray. She doesn't really have a very stressful life. So, when we talk about adapting to stress, much of the information on stress conceptualization looks at stress as temporary things that we just have to deal with. Even if temporary means days or weeks, it will eventually reduce. However, what if stress becomes a permanent part of the environment? Like it's something that isn't gonna go away anytime soon and you're just gonna have to get used to it. In these cases, people can either adapt or develop chronic strain from these long-term permanent stressors. So this is dependent on several things the type of stressor, so what it is, how you experience the stress, and the indicators of stress. So on average, most people are able to adapt psychologically to predictable and or moderate stressors. So if, you, if it's only moderately stressful and if you know it's coming, stress reactions will subside over time and you'll adapt. However, Vulnerable populations like children um, or the elderly show little adaptation to chronic stressors. 
One possible reason for this is because vulnerable populations on average already have less control over their environment. So they might experience high levels of stress before adding a chronic stressor. And then this can just kind of, you know, take things to their maximum capacity. Further, even those able to adapt to most stressors may have difficulty adapting to highly stressful events. So those who are already stressed too can be at their max and unable to adapt to even moderate stressors. So it can be difficult to adapt to chronic stressors that are extremely stressful, or if you're already really stressed, it can be difficult to adapt to only moderate stressors just because you're already really taxed in your stress response. Moreover, even if people adapt psychologically, so so far this idea of adaptation has focused on psychological effects, physiological changes can still persist that result in the negative health consequences outlined previously. So an ability to adapt to chronic stress is dependent on who you are, how stressed you already were, how you experience stress, and what the stressor is. So it's clear that there's a fluid, dynamic, changing relationship between the stressor and the experience of stress. Sometimes even the anticipation of a stressor can make you stressed out. And sometimes it can be as stressful as the actual stressor or even more so. And this would be known as anticipatory stress. So if you think about the stress for prepping for an exam and being worried about it, sometimes you find yourself more stressed leading up to the exam than you do during the exam itself. And sometimes it's equal. So this relationship between the stressor and the stress continues after the stressor is complete. The after effects of stress are effects that persist long after the event is no longer present. So using that exam example again, um, maybe after you write the exam, you're stressed about how you did or stressed about that one question that um, you realized you answered wrong or you read it wrong. Um, so the effects of stress can persist long after in some cases. So these after effects can include a shortened attention span, poor performance on intellectual tasks, ongoing psychological distress and physiological arousal. So if you think about feeling like you've just been through the ringer, like been through a stress, stressful event and you have nothing left to give. So using social isolation right now, that can be an example. So if you think about how you felt with it, these after effects can represent the period after a stressor, but before your body has been able to restore itself. So it's that midway period of, I wasn't able to, you know, fill up my internal gas, so to speak. Um, but whatever I just went through is now over. So it's that midway point. So when we consider stress, a lot of times we're thinking about big, clear, stressful events like the exam, car accident, COVID-19. But what about the little things? So minor stressful events are known as daily hassles. So those are those irritating little things like being stuck in traffic, hitting every red light when you're running late, doing chores you don't want to do, minor daily conflicts. So each hassle alone has very little impact on our health and produces little stress, but the cumulative impact of daily hassles can still be related and result in negative health consequences because often we kind of forget they're there after they've passed, so we don't notice that they're piling up on us. And a lot of times we don't... Um, use any skills to cope or deal with them because they're so minute. So daily hassles can produce psychological distress, like anxiety, um, adverse physiological changes, physical symptoms, increased use of healthcare services. So 
like I said, these hassles can, you know, maybe sneak up on you and add up over time and wear a person down, possibly leading to illness in a similar manner of larger, more obvious stressors. So these hassles can aggravate reactions to major life events or chronic stress. So if you think about, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, maybe you wouldn't have been so stressed if it wasn't for that accident on the highway that made you late. Maybe if this little hassle hadn't happened, you would have dealt with this bigger thing much better. So really don't sweat the small stuff, but don't forget about it and disregard it either. So as said with um, talk about allostatic load and reactivity, these can be impacted by stressful early life experiences. So our responses to stress may begin even before our own earliest memories. Early life experiences and early life adversity can impact our health in childhood and throughout our lifespan. So early risks may include low socioeconomic status, exposure to violence, living in poverty, stricken neighborhoods, other community level stressors, growing up in risky families. So by risky families, that means families with high conflict and or abuse and that are low in warmth and nurturance. So physical, emotional, sexual abuse is obviously incredibly stressful in childhood or at any time. But when it occurs in childhood, it increases the um, risk for health problems because of the intense and chronic stress that abuse creates that can tax those physiological systems for a prolonged period of time. So when it occurs in childhood, it can um, impact and overwhelm your physiological systems and impact your ability to deal with stress for many, many years to come. So evidence suggests that children raised in these risky families may have comp compromised stress systems. So things like problems with emotion regulation. So this can be like over control or under control. So over control can be, you know, you, you bottle all your emotions up and you don't really know how to express them. And then eventually, you know, you've bottled it up so much it just explodes. Or under controlled can be your, you can't contain your emotions, you can't um, regulate them, so they're just kind of all over the place. Also poor social skills, um, poor social bonding, poor health habits. So these children are more likely to overreact to mild stressors and develop a heightened sympathetic reactivity to stress, exaggerated cortical responses, cortisol responses, and or chronic inflammation compared to children raised from non-risky households. So being exposed to the chronic stress that risky households generally comes with um, can result in a very hyperactive, hypersensitive stress system. So as stated earlier, stress sometimes becomes a part of daily life and can be long-term and grinding. So if you think of COVID, it's been six months since it really first, it was about January when it really started to explode and become this really threatening thing that could get over here and cause problems. So sometimes it's just part of our daily life and you just have to grind through it. Other examples can include living in poverty, living in a war-torn area, being in an abusive relationship, being in a very high stress job, so chronic stress like these is a significant contributor to psychological distress and to physical illness. The ability to assert any control over the stressor is important, especially when it's chronic, having any degree of control over it can help. And uncontrollable stressors are particularly damaging compared to long-term stressors over which you have some control. However, 
Research relating chronic stress to health outcomes is really difficult to conduct because of the difficulty identifying causal factors. So with that complex interplay of biopsychosocial factors on stress and health, it's difficult to show that a particular stressor is a causal factor in the development of illness because so many of them, you know, interact together. Further, chronic stress is really difficult to measure objectively as people can perceive an event difficult differently. So in science, a really good sound scientific experiment will have clear operational definitions of things. So if you're trying to study chronic stress, you need to be able to define what the stress is. But when people can experience things differently, that makes it difficult. Even in chronic stressful conditions like living in poverty, some people may experience it as more stressful than others, depending on their own personal factors. So this makes these things really hard to study. But nonetheless, the data that exists supports that chronic stressful conditions are linked to health problems. Chronic strain associated with low socioeconomic status is a prime example of the link between chronic stress and health. So, you know, poverty, exposure to crime, neighborhood issues, all vary with SES and are all higher with low SES than with mid and high SES and are all tied to poor health outcomes. So although everyone experiences stress and everyone could experience chronic stress, there are privileges that, can, that come with being from certain social classes or being with certain groups. It doesn't invalidate the experience of stress and from a psychological scientific perspective, there are certain things that come with being from certain groups. And we can use that information to help build interventions and preventative measures that help out every group so that some aren't more disadvantaged than others. And one of these areas is workplace stress. So much of the time, if we think about our own source of stress, many of us will think of work. To fund my undergrad studies um, and any trips in high school, I worked the McDonald's grind for eight years. And, you know, I could go on for hours every single day after every shift of the stress ex that I experienced at McDonald's. So, workplace stress is a very common issue, costing upwards of $300 billion per year, um, making studies on workplace stress important for intervention and prevention. Studies on workplace stress are important to identify the most common stressors in a particular workplace, provide evidence for the relationship between stress and illness, provide possibilities for intervention, and provide information on an area that results in disability and absenteeism from work. So, common causes of workplace stress are a sedentary lifestyle, work overload, ambiguity and role conflicts, an inability to develop satisfying social bonds at work, and lack of control. So when we look at these, we can come up with interventions to reduce stress. So because many of us aren't working manual labor, like we did in the pre-industrialization age, the amount of exercise we get has declined substantially. Further, even in manual labor jobs, like maybe landscaping or construction, they may be active, but they could include so much stress that it kind of overrides and eliminates the benefits of the exercise. So interventions can include increasing exercise in the workplace. Work overload is a cheap factor producing high levels of stress. So workers may be required to work too long hours and or complete too many tasks. Like there just isn't enough time in the day for all the work that needs to be done. Often multitasking has become a staple in the workplace. It's almost like an asset on your resume. Like I can multitask, but there's a lot of evidence on multitasking showing that it really doesn't exist. It's more 
a very quick switch tasking from one thing to another. And often it results in either the same amount of time or more time spent than if you just done the tasks individually because you may be making more errors or you may be actually taking more time because you're switching from multiple tasks. So evidence suggests that more anxiety is associated with weekdays than with weekends, which may alter cortisol levels and then impact your ability to manage stress during the week. However, these weekend periods that could be used for some restorative processes often aren't used for that. And, you know, many individuals use the weekends to catch up on things at home that they weren't able to do. So they don't get to rest and restore, which can result in, you know, a chronic period of stress. Role ambiguity refers to when a person doesn't have a clear idea of their role. Like, I really don't know my place. In comparison, role conflict is when a person is getting conflicting information about work tasks or standards from different individuals. So, you know, one boss tells you to go left and the other tells you to go right, and you don't really know which way to go. That's pretty stressful. So both ambiguity and conflict are associated with workplace stress with, you know, chronically high blood pressure and elevated heart rate tied to both things. So in this case, clear feedback about what a person's role is and what the expectations are, are really helpful for lower levels of stress. An inability to develop satisfying social relationships at work is related to poor health and increased stress. So, you know, from my McDonald's era, I would say that's one of the things that was very protective for me is it's a very social environment. So there were a lot of opportunities for me to build social bonds, which really helped because, you know, they could understand exactly what um, the job entailed every day. But a poor relationship with a co coworker and or a superior can increase stress and a lack of supportive workplace relationships can reduce the social bonds that help facilitate health. So you don't really have anyone in your corner. So, you know, those work friendships are really, really important. Having a lack of control over our work is really stressful. So going back to the chronic long-term stressors and when you can exert some control over it, you're likely to do better than if you have absolutely no control. So having some control over our work can predict job satisfaction, degree of absences, as well as physiological arousal. So care second colleagues developed a model of the association between job strain and health. In this model, high psychological demands on the job with little decision latitude, so low control, causes job strain, which can lead to the development of coronary artery disease. Further, this the demand control support model posits that when high demands and low control are combined with little social support at work, there's an increased risk for coronary artery disease. So having some control over your work is important and social bonds are important and this can help mitigate high demands of a workplace. So looking at outcomes of workplace stress, they're significant and um, very wide reaching. So including a higher rate of absenteeism, so people are missing more work, which can impact the person themselves and the business, and then you know res the resulting economy impact. Higher job turnover, so people quitting and new people coming in, which is very expensive to train someone from the onset. Increased tardiness or lateness to work, increased job dissatisfaction, poorer performance, and even sabotage at work. So this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, breaking things, but if an individual feels the need to take matters into their own hands and do something, maybe they'll like reduce their performance or, you know, the time spent doing tasks, but purposely doing something to reduce the stress on their own. So to reduce workplace stress, there's a lot of different um, suggestions and the ones in your textbook is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure you could probably think of some on your own. 
Supervisors and business owners can try to minimize physical work stressors, like maybe extra noise, um, really harsh lighting. Just try and make it a comfortable area um, to work in. So I may have used it in another video, but a lot of times I think of The Sims and like their bars with the things they need. And one of the things they actually do need is like a good environment because that makes you feel more comfortable. Another thing is creating a predictable and clearly outlined workplace. So no role ambiguity or conflict involving workers in job decisions. So giving them some control and some input um, and make jobs interesting, make them fun to do. Further, facilitating social bonds can reduce stress in addition to rewarding workers for their contributions and accomplishments. So make it fun and involve the workers because a lot of times it's pretty easy if you climb to the top of the ladder to forget what it was like on the ground. So we've talked a lot about, you know, stress in early home life, stress in the workplace, stress in individual areas, but many people have roles in multiple areas and the combination can be stressful. So being a parent at home and being a worker in some sort of workspace. Combining work and family roles can be an additional source of stress because we're trying to balance demands of different roles in different areas. So these problems are particularly common for women because more than half of married women with children nowadays are employed. And on average, women still take on more household tasks and childcare. So working women who have children at home have on average higher levels of cortisol, cardiovascular reactivity, so more of those indicators of stress and more strain at home. So further, single women who don't have any partner at home and are raising children on their own have um, one of the greater risks of health problems compared to women with partners or maybe women without children at home. But nevertheless, as um, we can see throughout this text and throughout this course, there's nothing is all good or all bad. So there are protective effects of multiple roles. So, you know, you might hear someone say like, it's stressful, but I wouldn't have it any other way because there are reasons that keep them doing this. So, for example, combining parenthood and employment may be beneficial for health and well-being because it may improve your self-esteem, your self-efficacy, your life satisfaction. Um, like, for example, a person can feel, you know, proud, self-sufficient, accomplished. Um, they may feel like they have a purpose and they may feel passionate about what they're doing. And these can all provide protective effects against the stress of multiple roles. So when considering these protective effects, there's clear factors that lead to less stressful situations and allow for protective effects. So for example, having control and flexibility over one's work environment can reduce stress, which we've already discussed. Um, a good income understandably reduces stress because you know you can afford the things you need. Um, domestic help, adequate child care, so some support with children are important to reduce the load on the individual. So especially right now with children being unable to go to school, I can't imagine having to help my children get adequate um, education, stimulation while trying to do my own work. And having a helpful supportive partner. So this can kind of fall under domestic help and childcare, but whether or not you have children, just having a supportive partner at home can help mitigate stress and make multiple roles protective. But a less discussed but equally relevant topic is the idea of men in multiple roles, like working fathers, single fathers. Men experience stress as they attempt to combine multiple roles just as women do. Um, and on average, men are more distressed by financial strain in work compared to women being more distressed by adverse changes in the home. 
So on average, the sources of stress may be different, but every individual, non-binary, men, women, um, may experience the same, like, experience stress if, be, as they try and manage multiple roles, possibly in different ways, but equally valid and um, truthful. So as with women, multiple roles can be protective. So combining employment and marriage can be protective if they have the helpful factors to reduce stress, like adequate income, help at home, supportive partner. However, stressful interpersonal effects at work could be brought home, possibly increasing conflicts. So for example, after a demanding day at work, a father may come home and be more withdrawn with their children. They're just exhausted. After a high conflict day at work, fathers may be more combative with their children, might just be irritable by, you know, bringing work home with you. So it can be difficult to leave work at work. And as with women, employed and unmarried fathers are more vulnerable to psychological distress because you don't have that social support that you may have if you have a live-in partner. So the last population to touch on with stress is children. So there's a clear impact of stress on children as well. So as we've touched on the idea of early life stressors, difficult experiences at home can impact children's behavior at school and vice versa. So social academic failure experiences at school can increase a child's aversive behavior at home uh, or parents home and work stressors can impact a child so for example when parents are under stress from you know either stressors at home or work or a combination of the two there can be impact on the child's academic achievement and the child can even begin to act out so this is particularly true for adolescents so stress in children increases the likelihood of a child adopting an unhealthy lifestyle so this may be due to modeling of the parents or a lack of you know time and psychological physical resources that the parents have to help the children but either way a stressful um, environment for a child can impact their functioning so that's everything I've covered for chapter six, but remember there's still probably about 20% of content in the textbook. But to start with the first part of chapter seven, in this chapter we talk about coping, resilience, social support. So the things that help get us through dealing with stressors. So like I said at the beginning of the video, I'll cover in this part, I'll cover up until the end of coping interventions. And then the last bit of social support I'll touch on in a second part, just to help break up the workload a little bit for you. So to start with the idea of how people cope with stress. So in the chapter, it opens up with a bit of a vignette of how different people dealt with um, a major life event. So um, a natural disaster in this case and how different families or different um, people, different situations dealt with a similar event. So the interesting yet complex thing about stress is how differently people can experience it. And this is due to stress moderators, which are the factors that modify how stress is experienced and impacts the stress may have. So for example, people who have many resources, like financial resources, social resources, et cetera, may not experience something as very stressful, while people with less resources may find it very stressful. So moderators may have an impact on the stress itself, on the relation between the stress and the psychological responses, on the relation between stress and illness, and on the degree to which a stressful experience can intrude into other aspects of life. So coping is dependent on the resources we have. 
And coping refers to the thoughts, the behaviors that we use to manage the internal and external demands of stressful situations. So the things that we do to get through stressful situations. There are two important aspects of coping. So first, the relationship between coping and a stressor is dynamic. So if you think of it as kind of a series of transactions between a person with their resources, their values, the commitments, the environment, and the environment's own resources, values, and commitments. It's a dynamic interplay between a person and what they have and the environment and what they have or what it has. So coping occurs over time and can change as a person and or the environment's resources, values, and commitments change. So talking about if something initially wasn't stressful and then maybe you experienced financial hardship and all of a sudden something that wasn't stressful in the beginning is now stressful to you. So coping is dynamic and can change. But second, coping has a very wide breadth, meaning there's a lot of different coping mechanisms. And they can range from internal things like your emotional reactions, your thoughts, your emotion regulation, um, and to external things. So things you do to actually act on the event. So in your textbook, figure 7.1 outlines a diagram of the coping process. And uh, there's a similar outline in the slides that I've provided. So this process begins with the stressor. So an event, its stage, and its anticipated future course, so where it could go. Next, the stressor is appraised. So that primary appraisal of whether or not it's stressful. And um, is it a threat? Is it a challenge? What harm has it already done? And then that secondary appraisal, like, can I handle this? Do I have what I need? Next, coping strategies come in and are used to manage the stressor. So in the two boxes underneath the like process boxes, you have examples of external coping mechanisms and internal. So it could be either or, or a combination of the two. So external things can be tangible resources, like maybe actually finances um, or things like social support, major life events, daily hassles. Um, internal resources can be things like your usual coping styles, um, like acceptance, things like that, um, and other personality factors that can influence the selection of coping responses and strategies. So our personality comes into play in how what we do to cope and how we choose the things that we use to cope. Next, coping tasks are then used to reduce harm, tolerate a stressor and or adjust to negative events or realities, maintain a positive self image, um, maintain emotional equilibrium, so not lose ourself in the process or continue satisfying relationships with others. And lastly, there's the outcomes. So how did it go? So based on how successful you, you were coping, there's the outcomes of it all. Things like psychological functioning, ability to resume your usual activities and physiological changes. So as indicated in that coping process, personality can influence coping. And a big aspect of personality is a tendency to either negative affectivity or positive affectivity. So negative affectivity is like negative emotional states and is marked by, you know, anxiety, depression, hostility. And this can enhance the distress that's experienced in stressful situations. So people high in negative affectivity, so maybe see the glass as half empty, maybe a bit pessimistic, they can experience distress, discomfort, and dissatisfaction in many different situations. So if you think of, you know, your negative Nancy's, so can see like the stress in things that may not be stressful. 
or as stressful if you looked at it a different way. So negative affectivity is related to poor health, all cause mortality and higher levels of stress indicators like cortisol levels. So further, people high in negative affectivity are more likely to engage in poor health habits, like possibly as a way to cope, like things like heavy drinking, smoking, drug use. Treatment success is lower for people high in negative affectivity, which can hasten the course of illness. And last, negative affectivity can possibly create an illusion of poor health when there is no true health concern. So for example, people high in negative affectivity report more physical symptoms like headaches, stomach aches, things like that, especially when under stress. So, you know, this could be due maybe to increased tension, like getting tension headaches because you're always amped up or possibly because of a heightened awareness of symptoms, increased worry, an increased attribution of symptoms to poor health. So for example, a head thinking a headache is due to illness and not because of eye strain from sitting at a computer screen all day. So compared to negative affectivity, positive emotional states promote better mental and physical health. So positive emotional states have been tied to lower levels of stress indicators, like lower cortisol levels, lower blood pressure, etc. The immune system responds more effectively to potential viruses in individuals high in positivity, which could circumvent potential illnesses. So the old kind of unethical experiment of exposing people to a virus, people high in positive emotional states will respond more effectively and be more less likely to fall ill than people with high negative affectivity. Further, there's an indirect effect with improved coping and health behaviors that are present in individuals high in positive affect. So, you know, the more positive people who may see the glasses half full are more likely to engage in more effective coping and health behaviors. So when people are feeling good, they feel motivated to do things that keep them feeling good. So they're more likely to invest time into things that help overcome obstacles, which can accordingly lower stress levels. So a positive attitude can help go a long way. So next there's some further psychosocial resources to coping with stress. So on a related note to positive emotion, there's the idea of optimism which can really help people cope more effectively and reduce their risk of illness. Because optimism promotes active and persistent coping efforts. Like, I can do this. I can fight this. And these can improve long-term prospects for psychological and physical health, foster a sense of self-efficacy and control, so you feel like you can overcome and cope with stressors. But on the flip side... Optimists often have expectations of success. Like, you're an optimist, so you feel like you can do this. So if expectations aren't met, then there is the possibility of becoming stressed. Because there's generally this expectation that I can handle this, and then if it doesn't go that way, that's kind of a stressful thing to grapple with. Next, we have the idea of psychological control, which is similar to self-efficacy. So where self-efficacy is a more narrow belief that your actions can obtain a specific outcome in a specific situation, like I can effectively deal with this one thing, psychological control is a general belief that you can exert control over stressful events. So related to psychological control is secondary control, which refers to the idea that if you collaborate with family, friends, medical practitioners, you can successfully cope. So having psychological control, secondary control, is really helpful for coping with stressful situations. And it's so helpful that interventions have been designed to enhance control 
known as control enhancing interventions. So these can include CBT techniques to reduce anxiety, information on coping process, relaxation techniques, and um, other related CBT type techniques to improve coping, promote recovery. Self-esteem is associated with lower levels of stress indicators, and it appears to be most protective at lower levels of stress, but this protective factor appears to dissipate at higher levels of stress because at that point, the stressors themselves may overwhelm the benefits of self-esteem. So stressors that are particularly high may be so high that it's understandable for no one to have so much self-esteem that they feel like they can overcome it. Like it might just derail the self-esteem. Conscientiousness is very beneficial for coping, possibly because people who are high in conscientiousness may be more successful at avoiding stressful situations. They may think more about their health. They may be more adherent to treatment recommendations. They may practice good health habits and they may use their cognitive abilities effectively. So it may not be conscientiousness directly impacting um, coping, but more so the secondary effects of the behaviors people engage in when they are conscientious. Self-confidence and, you know, having an easygoing disposition can be protective. So um, not sweating the small stuff, for example. However, interestingly, people who are cheerful, so maybe more self-confident, more easygoing, appear to have um, a higher rate of mortality or die sooner than less cheerful people. So it's possible, so is it possible that, you know, being grumpy is a good thing? Um, one possible explanation is that if you're too easygoing, you may be less careful about your health and um, possibly take things less seriously compared to less self-confident, less easygoing people. So it can be protective in that you're not stressing over and getting worked up over smaller, minute things. And if it, you know, goes too far, you may not take things seriously enough. And intelligence is related to coping. So more intelligent people have better physiological profiles across the lifespan. So it's possible that maybe higher intelligence is related to greater awareness of health consequences and coping behaviors, like maybe just learn more. And if you think of the secondary characteristics or other factors that appear to cluster around higher intelligence, excuse me, like things like um, more financial um, resources. So it could be things like that, like the relation between intelligence and other tangible resources help with coping. And lastly, emotional stability is related to coping. So, you know, higher emotion regulation is related to better coping because more emotion regulation, you can effectively identify your emotions, express them, deal with them, and that alone can really reduce distress and help with coping. So related to the idea of coping is resilience which is that factor that helps people bounce back and adapt flexibly to stressful situations. So there are factors that help promote resilience and this therefore can promote effective coping. So these include things like coherence and purpose about life. So you know what you're working so hard for. So you manage to stay resilient because you know what you want and you know it's worth it. A uh, sense of humor. So being able to kind of, you know, break the ice a little bit with some humor, trust in others. So being able to lean on that social support, um, a sense that life is worth living and even religious beliefs. So some sort of spirituality appears to help resilience and it could be the spirituality alone and it could be the um, social supportive community that tends to come with spiritual beliefs. So those are all numerous factors that can impact our ability to cope. And there are also different ways to cope, different styles of coping. 
So a coping style is a propensity to deal with stressful events in a particular way. People may approach a stressor with an approach or an avoidant coping style. So in avoidant coping, people avoid and minimize the stressor. In an approach style, people attempt to cope by gathering information on the stressor and taking action, so doing something about it. So each style has advantages and can be more effective in different situations, but overall, approach-oriented coping is related to more success and better mental and physical health than avoidance coping. Approach coping can be related to maybe a short-term price because you're tackling it head-on. As you face that stressor, you might have a short-term price and maybe an increase in anxiety. But in the long term, because you're actually doing something about it, you can have better outcomes. So in comparison, um, an avoidant coper may have better success with short-term things, but struggle with long-term stressors because it doesn't go away. Another comparison is between problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. So in problem-focused coping, the person attempts to do something constructive about the stressor to reduce the threat. So it's very um, similar to approach coping. In emotion-focused coping, you're still doing something about it, like in approach-focused, but you attempt to cope by regulating your emotions experienced by the event. So instead of problem solving and doing something about the stressor, you try and regulate and do something about your emotions and your own internal experiences. So as with approach versus avoidance coping, there are times problem focus can be more effective than emotion focused coping and vice versa. But overall, situations in which there's something you can do, so there's actions to be taken, can favor problem-focused coping. In comparison, emotion-focused coping is more effective for situations in which an individual has little control and must be accepted as is. So possibly with the ongoing pandemic, um, at a general global sense, there's little you can do. So, you know, talking to someone and regulating your emotions can be helpful because there's little tangible action you can do. And another important coping style is emotional approach coping. So in this style, an individual clarifies, focuses on, and works through their emotions that they experience in response to a stressor. So this coping is really useful for chronic conditions like chronic pain um, and long-term medical conditions. So your textbook even mentions pregnancy. So things that aren't going to go away. So it can be particularly effective for stress management, especially for women. And this could be due to soothing impact of coping on stress regulatory systems and the fact that this coping style can help people affirm important aspects of their identity. And lastly, proactive coping, as the name suggests, is used to prevent stress before it occurs, anticipating stressors and acting in advance. So this requires um, different factors be present, like an ability, foresight to anticipate the potential stressors and the existence of coping mechanisms to manage them and self-regulatory skills to control and direct your actions. So you need to be able to see the stressor before it hits you. You need to be able to cope with the stressors and regulate yourself to control and direct what you do. So going to that last box in the coping process, the coping outcomes, hopefully coping should produce positive outcomes. But what, what is considered successful coping? How do you know when it's gone well? Individuals who have coped successfully with a stressor should exhibit some common factors, like a reduction or elimination. So hopefully there's the reduction and or elimination of stressors. Hopefully the stress isn't there anymore. Or if it is, it's much less impactful. Uh, tolerating or adjusting 
to negative events or realities. So especially for long-term chronic stressors, hopefully there's adapting present, um, maintaining a positive self-image. So it didn't result in like damage to your image of yourself. Uh, maintaining emotional equilibrium. So avoiding long-standing emotion dysregulation or dysfunction. Continuing satisfying relationships with others. So not pushing people away or damaging social bonds. Enhancing recovery when you're ill. Uh, so you should be getting better if you were ill. And keeping low psychological, neuroendocrine, and immune activity. So avoiding those stress reactions that were indicative of consequences of stress. So because coping is so important, interventions have been created to promote and enhance coping. One type of coping intervention is mindfulness meditation. And like, to be truthful, I kind of thought mindfulness was silly when I first heard of it. So a lot of people think of mindfulness as, you know, completely blank your mind. Don't think of anything. If you Google it, you'll get pictures like bubbles and, you know, nice pretty ripples across the lake and whatever that even means. But real mindfulness teaches individuals to have an awareness of the present, focus on the present and accept it. So too often, people spend their time either ruminating on the past and or worrying about the future. However, you can't do anything about either of those. This one hasn't happened yet and that one's already gone. So the only thing we have control over is like the present right now. So mindfulness teaches you to identify when you're straying from that present moment and accept the present. Now, among mindfulness meditation, Mindfulness-based stress reduction is a specific form designed to help people manage their reactions to stress and the resulting negative emotions. So emotions are acknowledged and not suppressed, but accepted and released. So no one, like most people don't like feeling negative emotions and they're part of our experience. If you took negative emotions away, you would sacrifice a large part of our human experience. So a lot of times, if you can just allow something its space, it will run its course and then leave like a negative emotion. So when we aren't fighting our emotions, like trying to not be angry, which can in turn just make you more anxious and stressed out, they're more likely to run their course and dissipate. So acknowledging that you're angry, for example, Keeping in mind your actual goals and what you actually want and maybe acting in a different way despite the anger, but not fighting it and just letting it do its thing. Similar to mindfulness-based stress reduction is acceptance and commitment therapy, which is kind of a third wave, third generation therapy derived from CBT. In ACT, individuals are taught to accept and not fight their feelings and this and situations that may arise. So for instance, your thoughts can exist and not be true. So you can have a thought like they think I'm stupid. That's just a thought, it can be there and it doesn't mean that it's true. So instead of fighting them, acknowledge them, like acknowledge that I've had that thought and that it may or may not be true and I don't have to act on it. So, you know, I should tell them off. Okay, I've had that thought. That thought could be true. Doesn't mean I actually have to tell them off. So these things can exist without you actually acting on them. So with ACT, people are trained to become aware of a stressor's occurrence and the conditions that cause it. Stress can create difficult issues and people may need to accept and move away from these issues while still persisting in desired action. So still going after your goals and your needs while these things are ongoing. So people may need to commit to a behavior change despite ineffective thoughts and urges. So despite being you know, stressed out, you still need to act in this way. Now, another coping mechanism is expressive writing, which Expressive writing and journaling has been encouraged 
really encouraged as a coping mechanism in recent years. And there's evidence demonstrating that it can reduce psychological and physiological indicators of stress, which can aid in effective coping. So, you know, sometimes it can help to express thoughts and emotions, even if it's only to yourself, yourself in your journal, and you don't actually do anything with it after. Effective writing can help a person organize their thoughts and find meaning and focus attention on positive aspects away from negative affectivity. Further, effective writing can provide an opportunity to clarify emotions and affirm your personal values. So really by getting it out of your mind and down on a page, it can be easier to see and then understand and sort through. Similar is the idea of self-affirmation. And this has been gaining a lot of scientific support. So it can include writing or even just saying affirmations about yourself, your values and your abilities. So it can help people feel better about themselves and, and what they're capable of. So on the biological level, it can lower physiological reactivity and stress and reduce defensive reactions to health threats. So if you feel capable and well assured, you're less likely to be defensive and self-affirmation can help with that. So going to your um, change journal assignment, there's that appendix on prefactual thoughts. So, you know, those thoughts that might get in the way, like I'm not capable of this. So a lot of times our negative thoughts can hinder our ability to do something. And self-affirmation is kind of the opposite of that. So instead of thinking negative thoughts that are going to get in my way, I'll give myself some self-affirming thoughts to help facilitate whatever I'm trying to do. And relaxation training, I won't spend a lot of time on because it's popped up a lot in previous chapters, but it's a very effective coping mechanism because it reduces arousal and the physiological experiences of stress. So like we've stated in previous chapters, it can include things like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and then there's other things like guided imagery. So thinking of safe, calming um, images, meditation, yoga, and self-hypnosis. So the last topic to discuss is coping effectiveness training which begins by teaching people how to appraise stressful events in a less threatening manner and disaggregate the stressors into specific tasks. So break it down. So it's not as big, it's not as difficult. In this, people are taught to distinguish aspects of a stressor that are changeable and then those that are not. So coping effectiveness training helps to encourage people also to maintain their social support. Don't withdraw and isolate and identify what can I actually do something about and what do I just have to accept. Within coping effectiveness training, stress management training typically involves three phases. First, people learn what stress really is and how to identify stressors. Second, people are taught and then practice skills for coping with stress. And then third, People actually practice the techniques in stressful situations and monitor their effectiveness. So programs to help with stress management have been developed and the example in your textbook is one called Combat Stress Now. And these programs have several phases of stress management, beginning with identifying stressors. And then next, there's a self-monitoring phase, so very CBT-like, and people in this learn to observe their behavior closely and record the circumstances that they found most stressful. In addition to the events, they can record their emotional, behavioral, and physical reactions to the stress. In identifying stress antecedents, people learn to examine what happened leading up to a stressor. So things never happen on their own. So learning to identify what led up to it. People are trained to avoid negative self-talk, which can hinder coping. And as with CBT interventions, people are given homework. So take home assignments can include a stress diary to record stressful events, how they responded to them, the antecedents up to those events. People can learn new coping skills, set new goals, like specific behaviors to help meet those goals. 
So it's one thing to set a goal and it also helps to identify things that you actually need to do to, to meet that goal. In addition to avoiding negative self-talk, people are encouraged to engage in positive self-talk and self-instruction, so kind of like self-affirmation. And to proactively manage stress, people learn time management and planning, in addition to identifying stress carriers and confronting them. So knowing what could cause stress later on and dealing with that. So coping effectiveness training is great for learning to cope with stress and to proactively prevent and cope with stressors before they even happen. So that's everything for part one of chapter seven. In the next video, I'll just finish up chapter seven and that will lead you to your midterm. So remember your midterm will be on Blackboard, multiple choice, 70, 80 questions, something like that. And it'll cover all of chapter seven. So when I have details about that or any further details, I'll post it on Blackboard. But until then, take care.